Welcome, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number three, querying knowledge graphs with Sparkle. In this last part of the lecture, we are taking a look on quality assurance and this is achieved via shackle constraints. Okay, shackle is in the semantic web technology stack somewhere in the upper part because it covers things like uh, Sparkle, it covers models that you are using there and it covers some kind of logic. That is also important because what you want to find out via Shackle is whether your graphs are complete and whether there are no errors or, or duplicates. Okay, but first of all we have to look again at the open and closed world assumption because they are really important for semantic web technologies. As you might remember, semantic web technology we are dealing with a so-called open world assumption. What does that mean? Imagine we would have the following fact available. A sheep is an animal with four legs. Now we have the question, can sheep fly? Good question. According to our knowledge base, it's difficult to say. In the traditional world, of databases which follow the so-called closed world assumption, only the information that is given is valid. If information is missing, this is taken as false, which means if in our knowledge base there is not the fact given that sheep can fly, we assume sheep can't fly because it's not given there. This is the closed world assumption, meaning it's not open for any extension, so it's closed in what you see. However, under the open world assumption, it's quite the opposite. It's like in the real world. So we see here sheep are animals with four legs. However, can they fly? We have no idea because nobody told us. Probably they can. So according to our knowledge base, we have to say we have no idea, but probably yes. So potentially it's possible, unless somebody states the opposite. That's the open world assumption that also is followed by all of the semantic web technology. So, in the open world assumption, unless we have a statement or we can infer that sheep can or cannot fly, we simply say we don't know. And in the real world, we are used to deal with this kind of incomplete information, don't we? Of course. So, in the semantic web, we expect people to extend our own models that we have created. We don't worry in advance that everything is complete. So this is one of the main points. We simply design our structures, our knowledge representation according to our needs. And in case somebody else is reusing it, he or she is simply extending it according to their own needs. So it's open. The open world assumption assumes incomplete information by default. So this is the design principle. We underspecify things. So therefore, we can intentionally underspecify our models and allow others to reuse and extend. Coming back to our sheep problem, we could now of course extend under the open world assumption our knowledge base in the sense that we say a sheep is an animal with four legs that, if lifted, can of course fly. It's as easy as that. Okay, besides the open world assumption, we also have to talk about uh, the, the unique name assumption. And there I want to introduce to you an interesting French guy, Henri Poincaré, so famous mathematician. And he is also famous for the quote that he said, mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. And this of course contradicts to our unique name assumption. Only for that reason I wanted to show you that guy. So in logics usually, with a unique name assumption, different names always refer to different entities in the world. Because, you know, the name is there given in a unique way. OWL as the, let's say, main knowledge representation construction language in the semantic web technology does not support the unique name assumption. And this is not possible simply because of the open world assumption. So there is a dependency between these two concepts there. The consequences for the semantic web are that different entities have to be declared to be different. So there are several old constructs, you will learn about them in next week's lecture. Otherwise, they are potentially identical, simply because of the open world assumption. 
On the other hand, identical entities also have to be declared to be identical because otherwise they are potentially different. And also for that, there are specific keywords that indicate exactly that two entities or two classes are the same, are identical. So unique name assumption and open world assumption, both of them, they are responsible that quality assurance then later on uh, for the things we have defined in the semantic web becomes quite a challenge. And since that we have to find a way or we have to add on something on top of it that enables us to do really or ensure quality of our data sources, that they are complete according to our definitions, that things are unique and that there are no errors. How to do that? The way how to do that is called Shackle and for that I want to show you how we do graph validation based on Shackle. I have here a small gra graph prepared for you. Let me switch on the laser pointer so I can better point. So this is about, as you see here, the Nobel Prize in Physics. And we have a specific one, which is the Nobel Prize in Physics from 2021. And we have three winners there of the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics. And this is Sucru Manabe, Klaus Hasselmann and Giorgio Parisi. And we have several information for that. So for some of them, we have a name, we have a country given, we have that they are persons or here that guy is a physicist and uh, physicist, of course, is also a subclass of occupation, which makes Giorgio Parisi an occupation. So this is already, uh, let's say, a sign or a hint that there might be something not in the way that as we like it. However, the main questions here is, of course, is this graph complete? And does it contain errors? And how would we measure that? So how could we find out about that? And for that, shapes in Shackle have been invented. What's a shape? So you see here a shape graph that simply reflects a data structure and some conditions that are uh, posed on that data structure. We see here we have a shape for Nobel Prize, we have a shape for person and we have a shape for country a shape for country. So these three things, they occurred in the knowledge graph that we saw in the example. Okay, so this is of course a shape for a class, Nobel Prize. Let's have a deeper look into it. And we see here, we have some data property constraints. So you see here, year has given a constraint that it has to have a specific or has to follow a specific data type, as well as name has to follow a specific data type. Then we have object property constraints. This is, of course, we distinguish data properties, which are connecting a subject to a literal, and object properties, which connect a subject to another entity. And of course, there also we have uh, a property and some conditions to the conditions I come later. It's exactly these things that you see here in the square brackets and uh, lifted upwards. So these are so-called multiplicity constraints. How does it read? O of course, here if you look at the year, you have one, one. This means uh, a year should occur at least once and at most once, so exactly one time. So e every Nobel Prize must have a year, does this data property constraint say. And the next one would say it sh also should have a name, but at least one and this Asterix or star tells you it can have multiple names, no matter how many. And also the Nobel Prize then must have a winner, which is a person, so which should be of type person. And it sh there should be at least one winner. And um, of course, there can be many. So we don't limit the number of winners of that Nobel Prize. And here person should have a name and at least one name, but a person can have also several or many names. And then person should be connected to country, so at least to one country. Each person can also connect it to many countries. And the country shape that you see here also should be connected to a name, which uh, occurs at least once and can also occur many times here. So these are shape expressions in form of a graph. That's a shape graph, which is rather easy to read. So let's have a look at it. Now let's try to validate our graph against this shape graph. So does the graph pass our schema? So far not because we do not know exactly where to start. So we have to define a target for a shape so that we know which shape apply applies to which node 
in the data. So targets have to be defined. So that's the first thing. So we define here a target at first for uh, the Nobel Prize shape and say this is of type Nobel Prize, which connects then everything which is of type Nobel Prize to exactly that shape and it has to be checked. So let's do that. Does the graph pass our schema? Unfortunately not. Why? Of course, uh, the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics does not satisfy the Nobel Prize shape, simply for the reason we are missing a name for the Nobel Prize in Physics. So you have only here the entity, it's connected to a year, but it's not connected to a name. The shape requires a name. Ha! Huh. Okay, so let's add the name. First thing we add here in green, you see here we have add, added a name, which is simply then 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics, given as a string. So, let's try again. Is now everything okay? No. Again, any winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics still has to satisfy person. And you see one of the persons here is listed in red. And exactly this is the guy for whom there is missing a name and also then the country shape. So it's not connected if to a country. Klaus Hasselmann here is only of type person. So that fits, but uh, the name for the person is missing and here the country is missing. So let's adapt it. We have added here Klaus, the name Klaus Hasselmann and we have added Germany, which is a country. And let's ask again, what about now? Unfortunately not. Again, uh, the result will be any 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics still has to satisfy the person shape. Why that? Of course, we already found out that, um, or like the other guy, like Klaus Hasselmann here also, Giorgio Parisi, um, he, for example, doesn't have a country that is here in uh, the USA for Suko Manabe and also here Germany for Klaus Hasselmann, for Giorgio Parisi, the country um, has to be satisfied. So, why that? Let's go one back. So we have here, of course, a connection to a thing which is called Italy. However, this is missing. It's not of type country. So we have to connect it to country, to the type country that was missing there. So this is a type shape. And of course, it says this country must connect to something which is of type country. And this is not like, for example, in the domain range thing, where we then can simply deduce the missing um, the, the, the missing type in the shackle world, in the shapes world. There um, we have the closed world assumption and if it's not explicitly given, it cannot be inferred or deduced. So we have to make explicit that this year Italy is also a country. So let's try again. What about now? No, still any winner of the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics still has to satisfy the person shape. So what is missing now? Yeah, what we said in the beginning, um, Giorgio Parisi um, has his occupation physicist. And um, as we see here, that's a, of course uh, a subclass of occupation. And what's missing is that the guy is a person. So that's simply then complement that here we have the type person given and then we have a complete graph because now if we test it for the target Nobel Prize, so the Nobel Prize shape, everything here we have defined here has or is satisfied. However, for complete quality assurance of the entire graph, we have continued the validation then also for all other entities which are given there. So this is then a kind of recursive process where we then have to change the target. You could do this in OWL. I know we haven't talked about OWL, but the problem there is, you can read this then by next week, how, how this works. OWL follows the open world assumption and does not support the unique name assumption. Therefore, it will rather difficult to find out about the completeness because if it's not given complete, it still can be extended. So we can't ask for that. That doesn't raise an error flag. That's the problem there. And also if two things occur twice, it's not completely clear if not stated explicitly whether they are really the same or whether they are different. So therefore these kind of testing on our structures, we try to do it here in that structure, but it's not the same. It's really difficult. 
Another way to do that, of course, I could handcraft also a kind of Sparkle query for a specific condition. And Sparkle provides the right semantics that, you know, you could find out whether these conditions that we have to check here are fulfilled or not, so whether they return a result or not. However, sometimes this is rather difficult to phrase. So have a look at the Sparkle query here. You should already be able to read it and uh, you will see it works. However, then you have to do this then also for, for all of the targets we have here and uh, that might become rather difficult and also rather difficult to test. Therefore, Shackle has been invented, which is the shape constraint language. So you have their possibilities to define your shapes, to declare your constraints and to also declare specific rules uh, that these shapes should obey. And of course, there are also uh, sparkle parts involved of it. And so this is a huge construct. If you're further interested in it, read the references we have linked here in the file. So then you will find out everything about Shackle. But what we will show you is how Shackle works for exactly our example that we had. So we want to do a node shape and property shapes for the shape graph we have here. And we start here with um, the node shape for the Nobel Prize. So please also note here that we have here um, the W3 uh, namespace for Shackle. So this is SH. That's a new one that we are using here. We have an own namespace S where we declare our example shapes. And of course, we also have here a default namespace. So let's see what we are doing here. We are declaring a Nobel Prize um, shape. We say this is a shape, a node shape. And we also define here directly the target class, which is Nobel Prize in a given schema. And then we define property shapes here. So SH property is a property shape. And then here in square brackets, you see here, we have to give a path. So uh, the property that we are looking for is name. And the data type that we want to constrain it for is here uh, a string. And we say the minimum count, so it should occur at least once. And we don't give a maximum count, so this means it should exactly occur once. Uh, no, it should. Uh, we don't have a maximum count, which means it can occur many times, of course. Uh, then we have here the property for year. So path is year. Data type then would be, it should be a year, like stated in the graph. And then we have a minimum count and a maximum count, and they are identical. So therefore, it's only one, exactly one. So that would be the node and the property shapes for the green one here for the Nobel Prize. What I can do then is, of course, I have to reference also here for the object property, the node shape person, and therefore I define another property constraint. Now the path has the name winner. That's the property we are looking for. And this here is referencing not a data type, it's referencing here another node that we have to define. So in the node is here p the person shape. And we also have to define person then, of course, here in our namespace. And again, the minimum count is one that we have here, and it has to obey a specific class, and the class it has to obey is the class person. Going further, now we are defining here the person shape, so as person, it's also a node shape, and then you see here the property shapes for name, and then for country that we define in exactly the same way, like we did it then for the person shape. And of course, to make sure that also person shape then will be tested individually, we have to insert also here a target class. So this then refers to the class person in the end. And uh, another thing what I can do, so we didn't show you now the country shape completely. So what you can do, of course, um, Shackle supports inheritance. And this means, of course, we can, for example, besides a Nobel Prize shape, we could define a Nobel Prize in physics shapes that simply inherits all properties and all constraints that have been defined in the Nobel Prize shape. So here we define as Nobel Prize in physics and say that's a node shape. And we simply say, yeah, this refers to the node Nobel Prize and simply inherits then all the constraints we have from there. So that's quite a handy feature. Here is the complete example. You can again look at it. So you have here again then all of the node shapes that we require for the shape graph that we have seen. Take your time, 
have a look at it. We won't go, go through that now piece by piece, so then you can, you can do this after the lecture. And if you want to play around with it, it's quite easy. So you, we have here, for example, um, a GitHub page, and on that GitHub page you will find the RDF example we were playing around with, and also the shackle constraints. And you simply load them, and then you go here to the uh, shuck, shackle uh, playground, and here on the Shackle Playground, what you can do is you can go to a validation service and then you can directly try out and validate and play around with the example you have seen here. It works, just try it out. And yeah, that was now everything in the third week. So we are done with Sparkle. We have heard about quality assurance about the stuff we have there in Sparkle. And in the next lecture, we will talk about ontologies as a key to knowledge representation.